take your Bibles this morning. Open up with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. As you're turning there this morning, on the morning that I prepared this message, I started out looking at the news and reading the headlines. Let me share with you the headlines of that morning. Here's how they read. Chicago, New York City, reeling after weekend gun violence. Over 100 nights of riots in Portland. Wildfires rage in California and Oregon. Police chiefs, majority of departments are resigning in major cities. Military tensions rising between the United States and Russia. Pentagon says China trying to build world-class military to match the United States military by 2049. This is in the midst of all the COVID-19 stuff that has thrown everybody into such a panicky fear and distrust and anxiety. This is in the midst of a time where churches are battling just to have their rights to be able to meet as we are. And this is a good group this morning. I thank you for being here. And I think about all the churches all across this nation that are struggling to even get into church And the government having pushed the buttons to push them out of churches and how churches are having to respond to that. This is in the midst of political unrest. Democrats accused Republicans four years ago of stealing the election. Uh, The Republicans this year are already accusing the Democrats of stealing the election. Does nobody have nothing new? Uh, We're just re- rehashing the same old stuff. I'm just looking forward to November 3rd when the elections and coronavirus is done. (sighs) This is in the midst of religious unrest in this nation. Religious unrest. There is a website called ChristianPost.com. What Christian Post does is they will post articles from a variety, not all that we would agree with, but a variety of whatever we call itself, a Christian organization or a Christian ministry, they will post all those articles on that website. And so you can go and just kind of in one-stop shop kind of a thing, you can read the articles. Here's some of those headlines. John MacArthur urges churches to challenge the government and reopen amid pandemic. Andy Stanley disagrees. No shock there that he would disagree. Um, he is definitely not a chip off the old block, that's for certain. Here's another headline, Christian, and I put that in parentheses, Christian author Jen Hatmaker files for divorce, applauds daughters coming out as gay. Franklin Graham had an article uh, where he said this, and then I'll give you the headline to the article. He said, the government will begin to tell the church how it can be the church, and they'll close the church down in many places. We see right now, because of COVID, the government trying to tell the church that they cannot meet, and the Constitution gives us that freedom to do that. But because of COVID, they said that we cannot meet. The article was entitled on August the 31st, Franklin Graham warned, socialist left will close the church down. The storm is coming. And I don't know about you, if you're sitting there this morning, you're saying, oh, that's never going to happen. Where in the world do you live? I, stop watching cartoons on TV. Watch something that actually will tell you what's going on. Because I think he's right on the money with that. I really do. Those sounding the warnings, and this is interesting. I don't usually do this, but for some bizarre reason, I decided to torture myself that day. And I scrolled down to read the comments. You know, when you have an article and then everybody gets to comment, that makes my head spin. But I'll tell you what really made my head spin on this one is that those articles, and I agree with what John MacArthur says, I agree with what Franklin Graham says, I 100% disagree with what Jen Hatmaker is endorsing and all of that, and yet the article comments were individuals that professed to be Christians that were pro-gay, they were pro-abortion, and they were pro-socialism. And I thought, and, and they absolutely vilified. They ripped to shreds any author, any article that held to conservative biblical truth. They tore it apart in the name of being Christians. We are in the midst of a religious upheaval in this nation of ours. 
a spiritual upheaval. It takes me to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 15 and 16. There are still messengers out there who are proclaiming the truth, and people just don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear what the Bible says, and yet God continues to send His ambassadors to tell the truth. In 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 15, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by His messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. Now stop with that for just a second. God sends these messengers who will tell the truth to God's people, truth based off of the Word of God that is not based upon the cultural mandates. God will send His messengers. Why? Because He has compassion on His people. But verse 16, But they mocked the messengers of God. In the comments, they mocked the messengers of God and despised His words and misused His prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people till there was no remedy. Till there was no remedy. As I read that and I listen to preachers all across this nation of ours, not just any preachers, but the preachers that are proclaiming the truth of God's Word, there is a national cry among the good biblical pastors in this world that the church is in desperate need of revival. We need revival maybe in this nation of ours like we have never needed it before. We are in desperate need for revival. Those verses that we just read a moment ago, there comes a point And we don't know when that point is, where God says, no more. There is no more remedy. His grace has run out. I know we talk about, oh, that grace just runs and just flows, and it's just ever going to be there. There comes a point in time where God says, no remedy. The word remedy in the Hebrew means health, healing, or cure. There comes a point in the life of a nation where their sins have mounted to such a great, great capacity that God says no more. This is incurable. There is no remedy. There is no healing. There is no health. There is no possibility. This morning, I want to begin a series of messages on this topic of revival. I don't personally know if there is still remedy available. I really don't know. But we have to consider the topic. A.W. Tozer said this many, many years ago in a couple of his publications. He says, I think what we need today is a good old-fashioned revival. By the way, this is back in the 40s and 50s when he was writing this, okay? This wasn't last week. He's been home with the Lord for a number of years. This is back in the 40s and 50s that he wrote this. We need a good old-fashioned revival. He says, I do not like to use the word revival because it has been abused in the house of its friends. Most revivals today are simply an enthusiastic meeting that does not change anybody and leaves them the same as they were when they first came in. We have changed the meaning of the word revival, and we need to upgrade our vocabulary. Revival, I like this, is not getting together for some religious hootenanny. That tells you this came from the 40s and 50s. It's not a religious hootenanny. If you go back and study the old-time revivals, those meetings changed not only people's lives, but the community as well. There was a power that did not come from the assembly, but a power that came down on that assembly, and that power was the Holy Spirit. With that in mind, take your Bible and go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And perhaps one of the most familiar verses of Scripture that the church knows, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, a passage of Scripture that definitely deals with revival. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, starting in verse 11, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart, To make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, read the verse aloud with me, verse 14, if my people 
which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And then listen to verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. That's what the Lord said to that kind of a prayer that would be made. As we consider this morning, this beginning of this message series on revival, let's start out with answering three questions this morning. First of all, who are the candidates? Who are the candidates for revival? Keeping the passage in context, we know that this was spoken directly to my people, because that's who it says, if my people. Well then, who was my people back here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7? And my people were none other than the nation of Israel. Now we are told in Romans chapter 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that we are to take those things that happened of old and use them as our examples, as our warnings. We are to take those things and apply them to ourselves. Does the New Testament ever refer to you and I as believers in Christ as God's people? Are we ever called, are we God's people this morning, Christian? Absolutely. We are a part of the family of God. So we take the things that we read here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and we apply them to our lives. We take the principles that we read and we recognize that those are as applicable today as they were way back when, when it was written here to my people. The word revive is an interesting word because I think when we start talking about revival, What we have a tendency to do is to confuse some things, and we need to get the understanding correct before we really tackle this subject. When we talk about revival, the word revive means to restore to the condition that once was. You cannot revive that which has never been alive. So revival is for God's people, those who have been made alive in Jesus Christ. One of the things that we have seen in years past in us, good old us fundamental Baptists have been guilty of this one, and it, it, this has always been to me laughable, and, and maybe you don't see the humor in it. Well, I do, because I don't like false advertising. Does anybody like false advertising? Okay? And so a church puts up a banner that says, Revival, gives the dates, 7 p.m. Really? How do you know that? How do you know revival is going to show up here at 7 p.m.? But yet that's what's advertised. And you know what? That's exactly what A.W. Tozer was talking about. It's a religious hoot nanny. Because, oh, let's, let's pack a pew. Let's get as many people in there as we possibly can. Invite your unsaved neighbors. Invite the lost that you work with. Yada, yada, yada. Wait a minute. That's called an evangelistic campaign, not a revival And yet for every time that a revival sign is put up, there is a plea from the pulpit, get the lost in here. No! That is a time to get the Christian in there and to get the Christians from all over the place. Get them there. That maybe, if that sign said, maybe revival, 7 p.m., okay. You wouldn't get too many people on that, would you? Maybe the first night out of curiosity, maybe revival, I don't get it. I don't know when the Lord's going to bring revival. I would love to see God bring revival to our hearts right now, right this moment. Can I guarantee that's going to happen? No. But if the Spirit of God moves, we can put up a sign that says, revival was here at, just in case you're looking at your watch, 1103. We can put that sign up after the fact because then we know. But don't put a sign up that says, declares it, and then it doesn't happen or it's just a religious hoot nanny. That drives me crazy. Maybe you think, oh, you're just, you're splitting hairs. No, I just want to be honest. And then people preach on the book of Jonah. Oh, what a great revival book of the Bible. No, it's not. No, it isn't. Do you not understand what revival is? There was only one person in the book of Jonah capable of revival, and he failed miserably. He was the one that was tapped by God. Go to the Ninevites. And he's the one that hops in a ship and goes the other direction. He's the one that the ship's, shipmates threw him in the water. He's the one that a big fish comes along and goes, and sucks him down. 
He's the one that camped out in the belly of a whale for a while. He's the one that gets puked up on a shore. God says, go to Nineveh. Okay, I don't want to go in there again. I guess I'll go to Nineveh. Did Jonah experience revival because now he's become obedient? No, he did not. You want to know how I know? Read Jonah chapter 4. Was the last thing we read about Jonah. He is sitting under a tree, angry with God, wishing he was dead because God went and saved those people. How dare he? He should have struck them dead. He was mad. Folks, I don't know about your definition of revival, but that don't sound like my definition of revival. How about you? That was a, that, the book of Jonah is the picture of how God can use terrible servants disobedient servants, wayward servants, servants who do not want their heart to be right. God can use them anyway. And what came to Nineveh was the salvation of those people. That's evangelism. That's the results of evangelism. That's not revival. Jonah was a failure. So we got to understand that. If you're a Christian this morning, you, my friend, are a candidate for revival. You are somebody that God can revive because there was a time in your life where you can say, this is when God made me alive. You say, well, how do I know that I need revival? We're going to get back to this in, in a few weeks to come, but how do you personally know that that individual looking at you in the mirror needs revival? Let me tell you something. Here's a real simple thing. That person that looked back at you in the mirror this morning, was that person walking closer to the Lord today than they were way back when, when God made you alive? Or have they drifted through the years? Have they settled into the Christian life, you know? Boy, it was just, it was enthusiastic. I was just fired up and I was pumped up. Man, I'd done anything God wanted me to do. I, that's who I was. And now you've been saved for a few years. Well, you know, that was just youthful excitement and enthusiasm. I'm a little older now. I don't have that kind of energy anymore. Well, I just don't know if I could do that anymore. Well, boy, boy, you know, when we first got saved, we couldn't get enough of God's people. Now, <laughs> once is enough. Can't handle you folks any longer than that. Once is enough. When we were first saved, oh, could we just, you know, could we just all live here at the church? You know, that's kind of how you wanted to be. Do we need revival? Oh, desperately, Christians. If our life does not look like the lives of that first century church, we need revival. And when we look at what's going on in our nation today, we need revival, church. I'll show you why here in a second. Second question we have to answer is this. What is the condition? Who are the candidates for revival? What is the condition that this is all being written under? Again, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 13. The Bible says, If I shut up heaven and there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people. Uh, verse 14, the last phrase. The land needs healed. Notice the condition of our land, if you will. When I started piecing this together and studying this out, it, it blew my socks off a little bit. Let's talk about the weather anomalies. Verse 13, if I shut up heaven, there be no rain, or open up the floodgates and let her pour. On Monday, some weather anomalies. Temperatures dropped from 93 degrees to 33 degrees in Denver, Colorado. On Monday... In a day. I thank God I don't live in Denver, Colorado. An earthquake struck New Jersey. How often do you hear about that? Nine inches of rain fell in June in Wisconsin, causing flash floods. Six inches of snow fell in Idaho on June 29th. Other places I'm glad I don't live. You don't think that's odd? Those are weather anomalies. How about this one? Back in first or Second Chronicles, it said about the locusts to devour the land. Listen to this. 
Swarms of desert locusts have devastated crops in East Africa, hit the Middle East, and moved into South Asia. They are breeding fast thanks to changes in the climate patterns, the weather anomalies, and they have brought about major cyclones and heavy rains, and they are feeding off human food supplies across continents. 360 billion locust swarms can be city-sized, and one of the largest, located in Kenya, covers about an area of 37 by 25 miles of locusts. That's like a dark cloud going towards defiance, about 25 miles. Take that 37 miles another way. It is so dense that it turns daylight to darkness for anybody caught within. In 2019, Las Vegas experienced what some still call the great grasshopper invasion of 2019. There were so many grasshoppers, they showed up on the weather radar. Get this one. This was just in the news within the last couple of days. Massive clouds of mosquitoes kill cows and horses in Louisiana after Hurricane Laura. Mosquitoes killed cows? Really? Lions and tigers and bears, sure. But a mosquito? The insect infestation. All right, in 2 Chronicles, we have the word pestilence. What is the word pestilence? The word pestilence is plagues of disease. Can anybody say COVID-19? And that's nothing new. According to Healthline, we had our first coronavirus situation in 2003. It was called SARS. Remember that? SARS was a coronavirus. Though fewer people got it, it was more deadly, and yet the world didn't shut down. COVID deaths have been about 3% of those infected. SARS deaths was 10% of those infected. Of those with SARS, 20 to 30% automatically went on ventilators. Of those infected with COVID, a far smaller percentage to the, to the extent that, remember how they were trying to get all these ventilators made and they never got used? Because it wasn't the same as SARS. SARS was worse. What's caused all this? Does the land need healing? So what's caused all this? Well, this past week, I'm going to share this with you. My blood was hot. I know that's hard for you to imagine that I get worked up about anything, but oh, I was hot. Here was the headline. Nancy Pelosi, and you say there's the headline right there, right? <laughs> this is what she tweeted. This is what got picked up by MSNBC and got spread out. She said this. Mother Earth is angry. She is telling us that climate crisis is real and has an impact. Oh, I don't know that Mother Earth was angry, but I'll tell you what, I was angry when I read that. And I will tell you, God is angry. Oh, we don't want to talk about an angry God. We want to talk about a loving God. Love, 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 love. That's all we want to talk about. Read Psalm chapter 7 and verse 11. The Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. God is not looking at what is going on here on his planet, on his creation. He is the God of this earth. It is his. And he sees what's going on. He's the one that's angry. Uh, President Obama, former President Obama, followed up on a tweet to Pelosi and said that we have to get to the polls and vote because our planet is depending on our vote and, it, and it's, our life depends on it. Ho, ho, ho. In October, the devotions that I write, I'm a month ahead. In October, there's a devotional about this. So if you want to get cranked up a month later, you'll get cranked up with that one. I'm going to go into more detail with that you got to be kidding me. The planet 
is not hanging in the balance by your vote or mine. Do we realize that? So why is the land in the condition that it's in? Why the weather anomalies? Why the infestation of the insects? Why the pestilence? Where's it all coming from? Let's go to the book of Job. If you want to tweet something that has intelligence, tweet the Word of God. Some of you are saying, tweet? We're not birds. (laughs) Ask somebody young beside you to explain it. Job 37. What's the cause of all this? Job 37. In Job 37, starting in verse 1, At this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of this place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He, God, directeth it unto the whole heaven, and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency. He will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which, he cannot, which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth. Likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. Jump, if you will, to verse 9. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. By the breath of God frost is given, and the breath of waters is straightened. Also by watering, he wearieth the thick cloud, he scattereth his bright cloud, and it is turned around about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. He causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Who's in control of it? God is. Listen to me. I hope... Somehow you might just ask God to make you ultra-sensitive to hearing the words Mother Earth, Mother Nature, and nonsense like that, that immediately when you hear that, you pick up on it and you know that anything following that, the person doesn't know their head from a hole in the ground. That that is an individual that does not know the Bible. That that is an individual that is going to stand upon mythology, that's going to stand upon uh, religions, world religions. But they don't stand upon the Word of God. I don't care what they say. Because if you stand upon the Word of God, that word Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Gaia, Mother Gaia, that stuff is not going to cross your lips. You are going to recognize that there is Almighty God, and He sends these things for His purpose. Sometimes we don't understand His purpose. Other times, it sure seems that His purpose is quite clear. And you'd almost have to be dumb to not figure it out, or totally blinded by Satan. What is the cause of all this? Go to 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is where things heat up really quick. If it hasn't been hot already for you, this is where it heats up. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. The Bible says again, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The land needs healing, not because the wicked are doing what the wicked are doing. As you look across the United States of America, and forget the rest of the world for a minute, just us. As you look across the land of the United States of America and you see what the wicked are doing, what is happening in our nation is not because of them, because wicked do what wicked do. That's why they're called wicked. According to the scripture here, the Lord puts the weight of responsibility squarely on the shoulders of of my people who are called by my name. If they will do these things, you know what that says? It says because they haven't done those things, then these things have come. But if they will do these things, then I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do this, and I will heal their land. What is the cause of what has been happening in the United States of America, folks? And the cause is the church. The church has been silent. 
The, the church has drifted from the truth of God's word. The truth has replaced the truth of God's word with, with the worldly ideas and philosophies and they've allowed it into the church and they've allowed it to change how church is done and how God is worshipped. God is not going to accept the worship from hands that have been stained and hearts that are stained with worldliness. It's not going to happen. God desires that which is pure. Folks, the land is in the trouble. It's in because of the church. That's why. I want you to take a look in Genesis chapter 18. Do we realize, church, that we, and when I say we, I don't mean just us here at First Baptist Church, Bryan, Ohio, but I mean we as far as those who are genuinely born-again Christians, that we are choosing either revival or judgment for America? We are the ones that are determining whether or not America experiences revival or experiences judgment. We're the ones. In Genesis 18, a familiar passage of Scripture, but start reading with me in verse 22. You've got those that have come to Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Bible says the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall be five of the fifty righteous, or lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And as the story goes, Abraham keeps thinking and goes, Well... I don't know, you can find 45 in there. So let's whittle that number down, Lord. How about if, a, if you find uh, 40? Well, that might be a little steep, Lord. How about if you find 30, Lord? Well, Lord, how about 20? Verse 32, as he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Ten righteous people would have spared the city from destruction. And ten couldn't be found. How many righteous people need to be found to spare the United States of America from the self-destruction, that is, the path of self-destruction that is going down? How many would it take? Not just people that are professing to know Jesus Christ as Savior, but people that genuinely know Christ as Savior, and people that are willing to put into practice what 2 Chronicles 7.14 says. Take it a step further. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Immediately, we think, well, it's because of the, uh, the, the immoral lifestyle, the sodomites. That's where we get that word from, sodomy, the, the homosexuals. We get that from Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why God destroyed it. Would it surprise you to know that that's only one reason why God destroyed it? And it was actually at the bottom of the list. You say, what list? The list that's found in Ezekiel 16. Go with me to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16 and verse 48. Ezekiel 16 and verse 48. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom, thy sister, hath not done she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were haughty, and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away 
as I saw good. By putting that at the bottom of the list does not mean that it is a lesser of sin, but rather it shows you and I because we think we know why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and we put that one particular sin all the way at the top, and we pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, that's not me. I've never had any interest in same-sex relationships. I'm glad I'm not one of them. What God puts at the top of the list is the sin that we all deal with. What's at the top? Pride. Pride. Now that hits every one of us, doesn't it? And the city of Sodom and Gomorrah came down because of that list of sins. Yeah, the one particular sin is in the list, but there's one particular sin that's in every one of our lists. Pride. When you go back and you read that passage in 2 Chronicles 7, notice those things that are mentioned there. It's a very close list to what's mentioned here in Ezekiel. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 2 Chronicles 7 holds out hope for remedy. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel shows when no remedy can be found. And in fact, in Ezekiel 22, it says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the Lord, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. There was no remedy. Has America hit the point of no remedy? Well, turn back, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I said there were three questions we were going to answer. I'm sorry, I can't count. There's four. There's four. What is the cure? What is the cure? We have looked at who are the candidates. That's you and I as Christians. What is the condition? How do we know revival is needed? What is the cause? We see that. What's the cure? Second Chronicles 7 again, 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. What is the cure? The proud need to humble themselves. The prayerless need to get down to business to praying. The sinning, they need to repent and turn from their sin. Those who have not been seeking the face of the Lord need to seek His face. That's the cure. We're not going to get into depth in this this morning. That, Lord willing, is next Sunday. But the Lord says, here's the cure. Christian, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if there's still time for remedy in the United States of America. I don't know. And some of you are saying, oh, that's just your personality. You're a guy that's, you know, the glass half, half empty, not half full. No, I'm the guy that's about that em- full and everything else is empty. That's my personality. But this isn't personality. This is just a fact. I don't know. You don't know. But what I do know is that if God's people don't try, there is definitely no remedy. I do know that. Is there still time for this nation of ours to turn around? Maybe. We don't know till we try. But there is time for you and I to turn around. While God may not have a remedy For the United States of America, God has a remedy, Christian, for you and I. And while there is still breath in our lungs and life in our bodies, there's still time for remedy. Do we want revival? Do we see the need that we have personally for revival? Do we want it to the point that we would bow on our face before God and start confessing sin? Starting with pride. At the heart of every sin is pride. If we want revival, Christians, God's more than willing to give it to us. He's more than willing. In fact, He wants us to have revival. He wants us to be in that condition. Would you beg and ask God to bring that to your heart today? And as you do that, you're saying, Lord, 
whatever in my life is standing in the way of revival, remove it. Remove it. Let me tell you, it's going to be painful. Oh, it's going to be heart-wrenching. The farther you are from revival, the more work that needs to be done to get you to the point of revival. And it's not my work for you. And it's those, your spouse, your family, it's not their work for you. It's between you and the Lord. We need revival. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. Lost soul, you don't need revival because you're dead. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. You need life. Guess what? We know the one who gives life to all who will believe. We know the one who gives life abundantly, freely. We know how to introduce you to Jesus. And so that you could have life, he died. So that you could have life, he took your sins on himself at Calvary's cross. So that you could have life, he arose from the grave. And still as an act of love said, whosoever will may come and take of the water of life, water of life freely. Lost soul today, you need Jesus. You need to be made alive in Christ. Would this be the day, lost soul, that you would give us the opportunity to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope that you will. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, oh Lord, we as a nation, the believers in this nation, the churches in this nation need revival. Father, we pray that it might start with the person that we saw this morning in the mirror. That's where it all has to begin. We are thankful for the promises of your word that we can cling to, for the truth of your word. Lord, it's hard things to deal with, but we must. So we ask that you'd have your way in this invitation, Lord, with each and every one of us. Lord, we pray for that lost soul today. This needs to be the day of salvation for them. And we pray, Lord, that that lost soul would come to trust you today. We pray it in Jesus' name.